HiSec Buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. This is Talking in Stations, a show about EVE Online. I am your host, Artemis Albosa. Joining me today in the station, we have Gregorin. Good evening. And Gregorin, you were just telling me before the show that you have joined a new alliance. Tell me a bit more about that. Well, you may have heard of Pandemic Legion before. Maybe. I don't know. It kind of rings a bell. Have you, have you joined Pandemic Legion? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay, right on. So the old pipeline of Pandemic Horde into Pandemic Legion still stands to this day. I am not the first former Waffles person to join Pandemic Legion either. Fair enough. All right, well, today on the station, besides that just small update to our staff news, um, it's patch day, currently Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. And boy, do we have a patch to talk about today. Quite a few significant changes, some of them expected, some of them not. Uh, first thing that we'll get into, I think, is the one that everybody was looking forward to today, which was the Concord Rogue Analysis Beacon, or CRAB. These were beacons that were meant to enable capital ship ratting in NullSec and LowSec. Um, and they have officially hit Tranquility after a good chunk of time on Singularity with a lot of iterations since they were released. And that iteration is kind of what I want to go through the mechanics of them. Because if you first interacted with these things when they hit CC a few weeks ago, then a lot has changed since. So we'll go through that. We aren't going to talk about like strategies to run them because it's a new mechanic. People are still figuring that sort of thing out. As soon as a metal meta settles in or if a broken strategy comes up, then we'll be sure to let you know. But for the time being, we want to focus on what it is, what it means, and how you can get involved. So, and I will ask Gregorin, have you had the opportunity to run these yet? No, I have, I have not. Right on. I played around a bit early on CC, but haven't used them in their current form. And like I said, the mechanics are what we're interested in right now. How is it going to impact the ecosystem? How can you participate? What are the rewards that you're going to be looking at? Not necessarily what's the best strategy to run these. Uh, suffice it to say, a Hodroid can complete one. Um, you can bring your friends if you'd like to. If you find it too difficult, you could bring a super capital if you wanted to. It's, it's entirely up to you. It's one of the design philosophies, as I understand it, with this particular mechanic, that CCP wanted it to be relatively flexible in how you completed it, except for one requirement. Now, one requirement is that your capital has to be locked on grid and vulnerable for a certain period of time. Yeah, the one thing I thought was really interesting about how they designed it is that the daily limit to how many of these can be run, which there's a separate limit for per character and per system, that cooldown is based on a is not based on downtime. Yeah, indeed. And let's let's go ahead and jump into it. So the the specific thing that you were just talking about, the limit per character, is integrated into the game as qubits. Sorry, CEQs or complex encryption qubits. And effectively, what it means is as you link to a crab. So not as you complete them, but as you link to it. So if you link to it and then fail the site or whatever, it's still going to count. But as you link to it, you accumulate these QEDs. And then after approximately 22 hours, your QEDs will regenerate. And so this is like a, a rolling 22, as I understand it. And effectively, what this means is you can only run a certain number of these crab sites per character per day, which to some people that might be a problem. I, I would suspect that the kind of people who are going to be farming these things for longer than you would be able to with the qubit limit, you're going to be the kind of person who has cap alts that you can just swap which character you're using. Um, that's probably going to be the solve most people use if they decide to run these things. It's also worth noting with these qubits, the capital that initiates the site doesn't necessarily have to be the capital that completes the site. So it may very well be that you have a cap alt who's not necessarily in a hodred or isn't capable of completing the site due to skills or what have you. That's fine. Bring it in, link it, 
start the cycle, then warp it off or do whatever you need to do to get it safe and finish out the site in some marauders or some other battleships or even your initial capital character in its hadred still. Um, so there, there's some ways to work around this. It is definitely there as an incentive for you to not spend hours upon hours upon hours of just running these crab sites and making obscene amounts of isk. Speaking of ISK, we should talk about initial numbers for the kind of income you're going to receive. As I understand it, a single site right now with the bounty prizes plus the red loot, which is, or I don't know that we can call it red loot because that's Pochvin loot. There are too many kinds of loot now. Um, what should we call it, Gagorin? It's not triangle loot either, even though it kind of looks like a triangle. Uh, I'm, I haven't, I've heard, I've heard the term red loot but as you said, that's uh, the stuff that originally was from Abyssal Space and now is also farmed in Pochvin. Yeah. So I'm not sure what to call it, actually. So for those not listening on audio form, there are these little, like, triangle-shaped polygons. I don't, I'm not even sure if a polygon is the right term, but prism? I don't know. Rogue Drone Loot. Let's, let's put it that way, the little canisters, little triangle canisters. So you'll get those, plus you'll get some mutoplasmids. And the mutoplasmids, like all new loot, their market volatility is going to be high right now. Um, so in some cases, they may not even have an estimated value within the game. But the, the cans plus the loot that you're probably going to get, or sorry, the bounty prices you're going to get from a single site is going to be around 150 mil in total. Um, of course, the faster you complete the site and kill the rats, the faster you're going to get that isk. Rough estimates pre-patch hitting CC, like CCP Rise was recently on FC chat with Pando, and he said that they were looking at around 350 mil per hour um, in terms of the isk that you would generate by just soloing these things in a hodred. So that's roughly where you can expect your income to be if you're going to be competently completing these things solo in a hodred. But of course, it's flexible. You don't have to do it solo in a hadred. And let's talk some more about some of the mechanics here. So in addition to the restrictions with the qubits, which limits how many of these you can run on a single character in 22 hours, there is also a solar system limit, signal interference. And there are, there are two solar system limits. So the first one is that only a single crab can be active in a system at once. So I'm, I'm sure that there is going to be a lot of drama over time, uh, particularly in rental space with the new rental um, scheme that's happening right now, where somebody wants to launch a crab, but somebody else beats them to it. Or like, who, who has the rights to launch the crab at a single time? I suspect that the qubit limitation will probably be a mitigating factor to this, but it is going to be something to keep an eye out for, especially in areas of space where you have very tightly packed groups. So I'm specifically thinking about Delve right now, although I'm sure that the, the leadership within the Imperium has devised some sort of method to dealing with this madness and preventing drama. They're usually pretty good about that sort of thing. But it's going to be less of an issue if you're more dispersed or if you have more systems available. Uh, we have some comments saying it looks like really high-end play. It is high-end in terms of the inputs. Like it, it costs, let me look at the market here, Right now, it costs around 100 mil for one of these crab beacons. If you just buy it from the market, fly it to your location, and then launch it. Um, and you also, of course, have to foot the multi-billion ISK capital to launch the thing. But in terms of the mechanics of completing the site, it's very much like rat spawn, kill the rats. It was designed, uh, CCB Rise Again on Pando Show described that they were looking for something that was less of an engagement hog. So if you think about abyss content or incursion content or the um, sotios, the diamond rat sotios, those are much higher engagement content in terms of how much you have to be thinking about what you're doing. These sites with their horde mode um, mechanics are very much the sort of thing where you can run them and it's just like lock, 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 shoot, 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 shoot next wave spawns, that sort of thing. So it is it is high end in terms of the inputs. You do have to be a relatively wealthy player to participate. There's a high barrier to entry. 
but in terms of the mechanics to run them or learning how to do them, it's relatively simple. All right, apart from that, let's get back to our signal interference. What does this mean? So signal interference, in addition to there being a limit to only one active crab in system at a time, there also is the limitation that only a certain number of crabs can be activated in a single system within 25 hours. And we don't have exact numbers on this and the qubit thing, partially because they're up in the air. CCP has been very open with if we're not getting enough crabs run, or if there are too many running, they can tweak these numbers over time. So definitely if you're, if you're feeling the impact of these limitations on you, or maybe you feel like they're not strong enough because there's too much income going into the economy, then feel free to get your feedback to CCP or to your CSM representatives so they can let them know and they can tweak these. But effectively what this means is there's a character limitation, but even if you have an unlimited number of alts, if you only got one system, you can only run so many crab sites. What do you think about that particular limitation, Gregorin? Well, like you mentioned with renters, one of the common rental models that it, different rental groups have, like it's the model that Pandemic Horde uses, but I don't think NC uses it for Brothers of Tangra anymore, is that you get one system and you have it all to yourself and... That's going to cause issues for people who want to target row crab doing it, that in a, their own rental system. Yeah, definitely. But it's, it's worth mentioning the more modern, I don't know if it's more modern, it's the flavor of the month, maybe, system of rental space. And you see this down in Fire Coalition space, like Black Rose, who we talked to last Tuesday. They have White Rose, their rental organization under this model. I'm fairly certain Brothers of Tangra utilize this model where instead of you pay a certain price for a particular system, yeah, like instead they you pay a particular price to be a part of the rental area. And that price typically depends on the size of your group. Um, yeah, but effectively, I know that B Brothers of Tangra's uh, <laughs> rental fees are based on corp size. I think Fraternity also does that. Yeah, and so that's the sort of situation in which the limitations on per system crab might not be a big deal for any individual renter just in, in terms of engaging with the content. I think the bigger barrier is going to be looking at rental drama, quite frankly. Like even under the old system where you had your system and you controlled that system, there was still a crazy amount of drama from people like flying through and doing relic sites, or maybe somebody's just hanging out in somebody else's system because they win AFK, or what do you do with PI and moons, and all sorts of drama. Um, and now if you have only one crab can be active in a single space, if these things get super popular, then and nobody has specific rights to any given system, well, you got to move your cap around, and there's not guaranteed to be a Fortizar in every system where it's going to be safe. And there's there's a whole load of opportunities for for fun and interesting interpersonal shenanigans to occur with these new things, and I love it. Yeah, I know that when, when Pandemic Horde made their announcement about what the rules were, uh, while I was still a member of the Alliance, uh, the rules were basically don't be the person who causes drama. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, most people don't try to cause drama. I think there's there's an inherent um, desire. If you are the subject of drama, you want to continue it because you feel slighted. So, I, you know, there are going to be bad actors, but then there's also just the natural escalation of people trying to, to have their say or to get their dues in a social situation. So those are the big limitations on crab. You've got a per character limit that resets roughly every day, and then you've got a per system limit that resets roughly every day. And again, these, these numbers and the frequency, they're all subject to change. So you're just gonna have to try it out, talk to your court mates, talk to your alliance mates, get your feedback to CCP and to the CSM so they can adjust accordingly. Now in terms of once you're in the site, right, you're the only one in your system who's running it, you've linked up, you haven't done too many so far today, when you deploy this thing, it's going to activate for about 20 seconds, and then it's going to live for an hour if you don't link to it. Um, after you deploy it, it's going to be visible on the overview for everyone. 
So anyone in the system can warp to it, just like a Sino. If you're familiar with those mechanics, everyone can see it, no matter if they're blue to you or what. And then after it's activated, you can link to it if you're in a carrier, dreadnought, super carrier, or titan. So no fax, no Roracle, which is very disappointing to me. I really wanted to run these things in a Roracle, but I guess I can't. That's unlucky. Um, but that's that's the thing. Carrier, dreadnought, super carrier, or titan. As a personal like request, CCP, please let me use a fax. Like if I could get a fax in there and then bring some buddies in who ne might not necessarily be able to to run the sites themselves because they don't have the tank or whatever, given the rats, and I can just come in and rep them with the fax. I think that'd be pretty yeah, I, cool. I th I think it would have been pretty cool if you did something with a fax like the old the way that C some people have run C high class wormhole sites using a Rorqual for Lachi and Lynx since it doesn't get the response that other other caps get as well as a couple of rattlesnakes. Yeah. I mean, I could definitely see it being broken if, if you get just a fax on grid with stuff. It's it's pretty hard to kill depending on what you have there. And so uh, the design of these sites with the solo cap required is that it's possible to kill these things was, was the design. It's meant to get pilots in space in ships where they're risking something and then people have to commit to kill them. So that's an interesting mechanic. We'll have to see how it goes. But that's, at the moment, your limitations. Carrier, Dreadnought, Super Carrier, Titan. Dreadnought with Hoffits being the most common um, most common ship being used right now. I'm loving the chatter about gating capitals around systems. I agree. That's going to be hilarious. All right. So then when you link to the, to the thing, you're going to be absolutely locked in space for four minutes. You're also going to get a couple of different uh, effects. You, you can't tether, you can't cloak, you can't warp, but you do have a slight resistance bonus, so that's nice. Um, let's hope that 10% is the difference between you surviving and getting some friends in to save you and you dying. And so then it's after... like a second siege, basically. Yeah, effectively. So your, your ship doesn't have to have a siege module fit for you to be sieged in space and vulnerable, which, as CCP has said multiple times, that's the design purpose of this mechanic. They want these sites to be rewarding, right? You're going to get 350 mil an hour at minimum, but they also want them to require you to commit to have your assets at risk. Risk versus reward versus engagement. Um, Although, I... If... I don't recommend running it in a dread without siege, though. Yeah, no, you 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 got a good point. Unless you're going to just warp the dread off after linking and bring in some marauders or something, I would agree. You're you're gonna wanna gonna wanna siege that dread. All right. So afterwards, the reason it's called a Concord Rogue Analysis Beacon, once you're finished linking, it's going to begin scanning. It's going to be sending signals throughout the system, trying to attract rogue drone NPCs who are then going to come to the crab and you've got to kill them fast enough so that this thing can finish its scan cycle and give you some loot. So over time, basically these things are going to come in, they're going to stop the scanning progress whenever the rats are there, you're going to have to kill them so the scan can continue and you get your end loot faster. Well, the reason why it's called that is because CCB came up with the acronym and then wanted to find a name for it to fit the acronym. <laughs> yeah. Can I? I mean, I can confirm. CCP Rise said explicitly that on the um, on Panda Show. If you haven't watched it, by the way, I should mention for those unfamiliar, Panda Ralica is a very well known, very experienced, and very talented fleet commander within the Initiative, and he has a, a podcast that hopefully you've heard before. If you haven't, definitely go check it out. Called Panda's FC Chat, where he discusses with various, usually fleet commander types, but also in this particular instance, CCP Rise from CCP's team. And they discuss all sorts of things from a very particular high end, null sec, large scale perspective. Uh, the last conversation they had with CCP Rise was about the new mobile observatories and the anti -clo cloaky camping type stuff, which is a very good conversation as well. So I'd highly recommend if you haven't seen that. We'll, we'll put a link to it down in the description so you can go check it out. Get some good insights into the development process and the ideas behind these various mechanics. Yeah, Pendo is probably the main whaling FC in the Imperium. He's definitely very good at that. Indeed. 
All right, so you're gonna keep on scanning, and if you've had the, the grid clear of rats for 10 minutes, right, so when the, the scanning is uninterrupted, then you're gonna get rogue drone salvage and mutaplasmin. And these mutaplasmins I'm super excited for. What they are specifically are drone-related mutaplasmids. So you have mutaplasmids, I believe, for the fighter support units, which are the things that go in the high slots of your carrier. They sort of buff all of your fighters. You're also getting mutaplasmids for drone damage amplifiers and those sorts of modifications. And then you're also getting drone, just individual drone, right? Your hobgoblin, your ogre, your valkyrie, those sorts of things, they're getting mutaplasmids too, which is incredible. No gecko, so all of you rattlesnake pilots out there who wanted to fly your gecko, no joy on that one. Um, but you are going to get it for all the rest of them, which is really freaking cool. And with that, the skills for these to buff these new drones came in previously. But I want to talk about these mutaplasmids for a second. And as I scroll down to find the details, what do you just, at the surface, what do you think about these new things? Well, I think incursion runners are going to love these new abyssal drones because it's one more way to squeeze every last bit of DPS out of what you can fly. <laughs> Absolutely, it's going to be wonderful. Um, so as we're looking at the mutaplasmids, you'll notice something, and that's number one, the naming scheme is a mouthful, but also very informative. So we've got exigent heavy drone durability mutaplasmid, exigent heavy drone firepower mutaplasmid, exigent heavy drone navigation mutaplasmid, you get the picture, and then projection mutaplasmid. And so what these do, and they have it for heavy, medium, light, sentry and fighter support unit and drone damage amplifiers but heavy medium light and sentry drones are the drones that you can use these on and they all impact different stats but that's just their positive impact so these are different from the normal mutaplasmids you're used to usually if you're throwing a prop mod into a mutaplasmid it's just a 50 mn mutaplasmid gravid decayed what have you and you roll it and it'll roll everything, positive or negative. These ones, the particular stat in the name is guaranteed to be positive. So if you use a durability mutaplasmid, you are guaranteed to buff the HP on your drone. If you use a damage mutaplasmid, a firepower mutaplasmid, you're guaranteed to get increased damage out of that drone. Everything else though, it's the pure one way or the other. Now overall it is leveled so that over time, law of large numbers, things are going to be lower on the rest of the stats, but you could roll everything positive on any one of these mutaplasmids. You're just guaranteed for whichever one you choose, that stat's going up, which is epic. I love that. What do you think about that, Gregorin? Yeah, I, I like the idea of a focused, uh, you, you know one of the things that's going to be positive. And like I said, I think the damaged ones will be in the highest demand. Absolutely, yeah. Damaged ones are going to be pretty high. I like the navigation ones personally, um, because they not only buff, as I understand it, they not only buff your speed of your drones, but also the tracking speed. So I can imagine um, some Abyssal runners using these a lot. For me personally, I use a setup of Ishtars when I'm running some wormhole sites, and the limiting factor on my income isn't actually the damage that my drones do, it's their speed. So that's why I fit armor fit, because even though I could tank it better and get a higher DPS number out of a shield fit on my Ishtars, the drones, I need those drone navigation computers in my mid slots so they can go from rat to rat faster. So those navigation things, because they increase the speed but also the tracking speed, so I'm hitting those frigates better, is also going to be really cool. Uh, there's a question, can you stack multiple plasmids for multiple effects? No. So this is similar to regular mutaplasmids in the sense that once you've rolled a module or a drone, you cannot roll it again, so it will not stack. That would be absolutely insane. Alright, so that's really freaking cool. There are also some comments about how this impacts Gila's specifically. Uh, I want to check the Gila market, actually. Hold tight. And while I do that, Gregorian, can you talk a little bit about what's special about Gila's and their drone? Well, Gr the Garista's line of ships, uh, all three of the subcapitals, uh, the capitals are slightly di different, but a bit weirder, uh, have a bonus. They, they have 
a big shield tank bonus and a missile bonus, but the main thing that they have is uh, a dr they can only fit two... They can only use two drones at once with a substantial bonus to durability and damage from those drones. Yeah, so what they effectively do is they limit your bandwidth to 20 megabits per second, and then they have massive bonuses to the damage and the HP of those drones. So these are typically used in the Abyss, where your drones are going to get shot quite frequently, and that, that HP bonus is crucial to the effectiveness of those. Similarly, in PvP fleets, I think Templus Calcif, Calcif is the most famous for their Gila fleets. Oh yeah, where... the last Spartan uh, loves his Gila's for a while. Uh, they've been mostly flying Tengu's recently, now that the Wrecking Crew has become a... Uh fairly substantial block, but Gila's are a classic doctrine that they flew and then brought into Wrecking Crew. Indeed. And in addition to the Gila, which is going to be great for Abyss Runners, there's also going to be the Rattlesnake, which we should mention. It used to be like top dog. When you were talking Nullsec ratting, it was either you were doing it in a carrier or a titan, back when titans had haws or you were doing it in a rattlesnake. And that's because the rattlesnake can get some crazy DPS out of both its missiles and its drones. And you get two heavy drones, similar to the Gila's two medium drones. And that again, synergizes extremely well with these new mutaplasmids. Because if you're, if you're trying to do a full flight, getting all of your rolls to be a particular way or so that you don't have like just one really freaking slow drone and all the rest of them are shooting the target two or three times before it catches up to them, that sort of thing. Um, it's a lot easier to get uh, better rolls, or you have a limited number of drones that you need to use to get oh, yeah. these um, get these things better. I love the rattlesnake, but it's just not cost effective for what it does now. With both the change to build prices for build building battleships and to building faction ships. Yeah. And in addition to this, they renamed the skill. So it used to be called Rogue Drone Specialization. Now it's Mutated Drone Specialization. And if you're going to be flying these mutated drones, you want this skill. It will buff your drones. It's like another specialization skill. You aren't going to be flying Ogre 2s unless you've got a good level in Galente Drone Specialization. Don't be flying mutated drones unless you've got a good skill in mutated drone specialization. Because that's going to be pretty incredible. Um, so that's really cool. I'm, I'm super pumped to see what people do with these kind of drones. I can't imagine the kind of damage that you're going to be able to get on like a rattlesnake called Dari Navy Wasp. It would be insane. Uh, so that's pretty cool. You're going to get those once again, those mutaplasmids coming from the new crab sites, the capital ratting sites, Corn Cord Rogue Analysis Beacon. It's going to come at the end. So after you've cleared the rats away for fast enough, for long enough, then you're going to get a loot drop. And what's cool about this loot drop, I want to mention again, is that the loot drop is limited. So in the past, when new features have rolled out, Podgefen being the most recent one, there are mechanics in place where players will swoop in and steal the loot from you. Well, CCP thought of it this time, and they have it so that for two minutes after the successful scanning, you, the person who linked to the crab, will have exclusive access to the cargo hold. So if you brought your capital in and then warped off later, you will have to come back to loot or they'll have to kill the crab and you can shoot it or you can let it self-destruct. But no matter what, when it does die, there will be a 100% drop of the contents. So if you're a hunter, as an example, and you want to come through and force off whoever happened to have been running this site, you can kill the crab, steal the loot, which is pretty cool. But they have prevented that sort of seagulling was the term for it when it happened in Pochfin most recently. Um, it also happened with the Sotios in Nullsec, the Diamond Rat Sotios. So it's good to see that CCP has implemented just right off the bat some mechanics to try and prevent people coming in with just interceptors cloaked off grid, swooping in and stealing the loot. I do want to talk for a moment about the way that this loot is split up. And that's specifically how it interacts with the ESS and with the dynamic bounty system. There were a lot of people who were 
upset with these crab sites coming in. They felt they weren't lucrative enough, which is an open question as of right now. We'll have to see how players behave. But specifically with how the bounties interacted with the ISK that you get, or sorry, the ISK gets taken away into the ESS and into the dynamic bounty system. And the ESS, what that does is it pulls a certain portion of all the ratting income, all the bounties that you get, sticks it into the encounter surveillance system. After a certain period of time, that gets paid out or it can get stolen. And an even smaller portion of that goes into the reserve banks. Dynamic bounty system is effectively a way of balancing the income you can make in systems which are super safe. So if you're out in the far reaches of Nullsec, nobody ever goes out there, nobody dies, it's just you, peace, quiet, and rats, then you're going to be making less, <coughs> less income. But with the mechanic that you have a small portion of your income coming from bounty prizes and a larger portion coming from the loot, that means the DBS and the ESS are less impactful. They're still going to take their cut, but they're not going to be as big of a cut as I think a lot of people were expecting. So that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. And that also means that this loot has the opportunity to be captured, stolen, or killed on its way back to Empire to sell, which is also cool. All right, any final thoughts on the crab? Have I missed anything, Gregor? Not really. I, I mostly source my income from methods other than ratting, so I haven't put too much thought into this. Like, I'm really interested in the market changes, though. Yeah, let's talk about those. So this was the unexpected change from this particular uh, patch day, which is that the tax relief, the three months tax relief, has ended. And with it, things didn't just go back to normal. They got tweaked a bit. So we have new values for your sales tax and for your broker's fees. Previously, yeah, I, sales... Go ahead, Gruorn. I like that. I really like that they're shifting the cost from broker's fees to sales tax because that means that it, it's easier to put up market orders since the more of the tax is taken when the sale goes through. Yeah, I agree. And it also... There's an extent to which I'm not happy with low broker's fees because it means people will point one isk each other. But given the changes to you literally can't point one isk anymore, it has to be like 10% the value of the market order. Um, it's within that three sort of significant thing. figures. Yeah. So due to those changes, I think I'm happy with this now. And the specific adjustments to the, ta to the taxes at base, it used to be 2.5% sales tax. That's now going up to 8%. And you may think, whoa, that's crazy. You got to remember, it used to be at 5% normally. So this is an increase from effectively 5% to 8% if you're looking pre-tax relief to current. And then broker's fees, they went from 5% down to 3%. So overall, your total taxes on any individual item, once it's listed on the market, um, you're going to get that 3% broker's fee. And then if it's sold immediately, it doesn't have to get relisted, then you're looking at a total of 11% taxes on it without any standings modification. Now, when you're looking at standings, you're looking at skills, things can be adjusted even more. So your sales tax for, a, for an item can go to 3.6%, and then your broker's fee can go down to 1% for a total of 4.6%. So overall, if you've got skills and such, your total taxes will still be lower, which I think is important to note. So if you're, if you're doing zero skills, zero standings, it would have you, total taxes are higher. But if you have maxed out skills for your broker's fees or whatever, or for your sales tax and your standings are good, then you're getting lower taxes than was possible previously. What impact do you think these sort of tax changes are going to have, Gregorin? Well, I think it's, well, it's definitely going to shift trade back to the perimeter keep star. Go ahead and walk us through a little bit. Why did trade, or what is the perimeter keep star, and why did trade leave it to begin with? The perimeter keep star is one previously owned by someone associated with talking stations, Matterall, uh, the founder of talking stations, and uh, he he gave it to Test, who anchored it as a shared market hub in agreement with. Uh, the other really big NullSec alliances, Pandemic Horde and Goon Swarm, and their coalitions. 
Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I do want to quickly clarify on the whole giving it thing. There was a sale involved. Um, if you want to go back to those older episodes, it was an interesting time of keep stars not being safe and the political landscape was changing and so this keep star that Matterall had and was anchored had to be taken down and sold and he did end up selling it specifically to test alliance please ignore uh, but continue with your story Gregorin. yeah so it, it is now uh, a market hub it one gate out from Jita, so you can access a, a you can access the regional market and buy things that are sold in Jita. And if you're placing a buy order in, in perimeter, you don't ha have to worry about the costs being affected by your skills or Kaldari Navy standings. Yep. And it's, I think the, the minimum tax on a Citadel, it used to be 0%, now it's 1% which is worth noting because that's less than the minimum tax in an NPC station, even if you have max skills. So even if you, even if you have max skills, you're still going to be saving money if you're using a Citadel with a low tax, if it's got a low tax. They could set it high, TTT specifically, they're there for profit, so they're setting it low to try and have as many people use the station as possible. So your high value items are likely going to transition back over to the Tranquility Trading Tower. And the reason they left to begin with was this tax break that occurred. Um, you know, an end of scarcity was announced, et cetera, et cetera. They brought in this tax relief scheme. And the net result was that your taxes in a NPC station, if you had max skills, were going to be lower than your taxes in the Tranquility Trading Tower. So everybody who had their assets on the market, um, they wanted a shift because they would make more money per sale if they sold it in Jita itself than in Tranquility Trading Tower. That's flipped back again. So now people are probably gonna see stuff moving back over to that TTT market and that income generation is starting to flow again. Worth noting, the story of TTT is a bit interesting. It used to be solely owned by Tess and then there were a lot of battles and high sec fights with thousands of Feroxes on each side fighting each other over this high sec keep star. And so eventually a profit sharing agreement was made um, we don't know the exact details, but I think, Gregorin, you mentioned it's Test, Horde, and Imperium. Goonswarm specifically are the three big players, right? Right. I think Fraternity might be uh, might have gotten a share recently, but I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a, a cartel indeed. It is an interesting situation to be in, um, but yeah, that's what it is. It was a, a big point of drama when the when the big war was happening was that this the war was fake because they're all still making money off of this high set keep star and if one side actually cared then they'd cut off the high set keep star income or whatever but man, i don't think the war was fake guys i think we're past that anyway it there were uh during the hotter parts of the war they more value was being destroyed in a single week and i'm not even talking about it the week that when M2 happened, I'm talking about a, a typical week in maybe September or October of last year would have much more, more stuff destroyed than had been, the then had been made for the whole cartel during the entire war up to that point. Yeah. So it, it wasn't it wasn't enough to offset the cost of the war by any means whatsoever. Yes, it was income. Income is always helpful and useful, but it was not worth not fighting a war over or what have you. It didn't offset the cost. All right. Well, that's the the majority of the important fixes and changes going on with these um, with the patch day today. I will note where you can get the Concord Rogue Analysis Beacon, other than just the market in Jita. You can buy the blueprints off of the Concord and DED LP stores. So you incursion runners out there, or former incursion runners, if you've got a lot of Concord LP, might be worth cashing out some of it while the cost of these things is still relatively high. Um, and then, of course, you, you can manufacture them. So as well, any of you industrialists out there, any time a patch day hits, the new stuff always is going to be at near its highest value. So it's worth taking a look at. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Why didn't Imperium break the TTT no 
negotiations and decided to destroy TTT. That's like, generally fighting in high sex sucks. If you there's that get, yeah. yeah, if you could get away with not fighting at high sec, you don't want to fight at high sec. Especially, uh, the Imperium was smart enough to realize that they don't want to be attacking a Keepstar in Max Tide if they have any other option. Yeah, and especially if they don't have supers to do it with in high sec. There's that. There's also the fact that when a war is going on, you're probably going to want to focus on protecting your members' assets in their home regions. Um, alternatively, you can you can do a counterattack, which I think is what you're referring to, where you'd attack the Keepstar uh, as opposed to just having to play defense the whole time. But as Gregorin mentioned, attacking a Keepstar in high sec is hard, especially when you can't fly caps, you can't fly supers, and you're fighting at that sort of scale. It's a massive pain in the butt, and quite frankly, the Imperium's time and resources had greater value, had more destructive potential by going and burning down the home regions of what used to be Legacy Coalition at the time. So uh, it, it would have honestly been a waste of time. They could have killed more, wrecked more havoc by just focusing on the former home regions of Happy Coalition and Legacy Coalition than they would have by attacking this Keepstar. And if they do attack the Keepstar, well, then they're losing some income themselves. So they're, they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot. Plus, there's also the idea of their negotiating power in the future. All right, so if you're an organization and it's known that you will break your word, you will go back on your agreements, that's a big deal in EVE Online nowadays. Players have matured in terms of the, the null block leadership to the point where most groups don't want to break their word. If they've made an agreement, they're going to stick to it because they know that this game is going on for years. This game is going on for decades. And if you get known for someone who's untrustworthy, that's going to stick with you much longer than the temporary isk that you may get from killing the TTT or saving the TTT or what have you. One thing I forgot to mention with the Concord Rogue Analysis Beacon, we talked about those two limitations, the per system limit, which is signal interference, the per character limit, the qubits or CEQs, those are displayed in the UI. So that's pretty freaking cool. Um, you can keep an eye on those to know how to do things. Alrighty, so those are the two big changes that happened on patch day today. We had the tax changes, which were huge. It means the TTT is coming back into power. We've got the crab changes, which is going to be pretty cool. Some good income for capital pilots. We'll have to see how the player base adopts these and fights over them in the future. In other CCP news, or not necessarily CCP news, sort of the intersection of CCP and the players, we've got the Alliance Tournament. So the Alliance Tournament flagship submissions finally came through. Everybody who could apply for a flagship did, as far as I can tell. including and test. Yeah, including Test, who didn't qualify. Come on, guys. It's um, mostly Bargusts. Yeah, so if, you, if we scroll down the list here, you're going to see a lot of very similar ships, the Bargast being the Mordu's Legion battleship with some very fast, it's got huge bonuses to its tackle module, specifically scrams and warp disruptors. Yeah, it's a, the, I think it's their Galente bonus that gives them a range and uh, or tackle range, and it's I think it's the Kaldari bonus that improves it was their missile range by increasing the, the, fl the speed but reducing the flight time. Yeah, and with those bonuses, the Bargus is an interesting spot where you can fit it with Torps and get like surprisingly good range on your Torps, but if you fit it with rapid heavy missile launchers, you're doing a crap ton of damage at an absolutely insane range. And it's also, the bonuses it has to its missiles are really unique, and that is not just to their flight time, it's mostly to their flight velocity. And there's, I think there's actually a reduction to their flight time. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a 50% to flight time, 300 to velocity. So, so your, your missiles, there's not as much of a delay between when they hit and when you fire. I do want to check the price history real quick, see if since this dev blog happened, there's been a spike in the market. Doesn't look like it. Um, with the flagship and an Alliance Tournament rules, I, should, I suppose I should clarify, the Alliance Tournament is a returning feature of EVE Online where different alliances, in this particular time groups of players under the mercenary rules, 
can gather together and fight in a 10v10 tournament. And it's broadcast by CCP, organized by the community team. CCP Aurora has been really championing it and bringing it back this year, which is cool. Um, but the flagship is effectively a ship where you can break the rules. You can bring in this one battleship and there are widened restrictions on what you can fit. You can fit super expensive mods. Um, you can really bling them out with Officer and with Mutaplasmids and Abyssals and stuff, whereas normally you'd have to fit T2 ships. And also, I'll have to double check the rules, but I'm pretty sure it's still the same this year where that can't be banned. So if a team comes in, they say, yeah, hey, I've... we're banning a bar guest, you can say, nope, that's my flagship, and I'm bringing one anyway. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the reason why uh, the bar guest was the most popular pick is because everyone... Everyone expects Mordu's Legion ships to be the ones most likely to be banned, especially the Bargast, since this is pretty much the Mordu's Legion tournament this year, and Mordu's Legion ships have a lower points cost than other faction ships. Indeed. We do have some slight adjustments. We've, we've got the Golem in there. Worth noting for the Marauders, we've also got a few Vargers as well. The Marauders can't fit the Bastion module. So these, these are unbastioned Golems and Vargers if they do bring them. Uh, some Nightmares, some Vindicators as well, and Scorpion Navy issues. So definitely a lot of missile boats, which is fairly common. Um, surprisingly, I haven't seen a single Balgorn, which I think is the result of some of the changes to the rules where the pimping that you can do on a Balgorn isn't as valuable anymore. I thought so, one of the rules was Balgorn was one of the ships not eligible to be a flagship this year. You may be right. Let me try and find those rules. While I do that, you want to talk a little bit about um, like the AT in general and how things are shaping up this year? Well, the Alliance tournament, I... it, 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 this is the first time it's been run in a couple of years, so... A few teams got in based on their performance in community tournaments instead of their performance in previous tournaments. And then a few more got in based on a, an auction where they, a silent auction where they, the ones that bid the most. So, and then there has been a qualifying round for alliances which did not get in at up to that point so we've already seen a few if uh, a few events of uh, some of the alliances that are participating yeah indeed and I, I should bring up or i should mention rather i was corrected in the chat that or not corrected but it was brought to my attention again that even t who are a, a community group um, man, I forget their names already. Bay Air J comes to mind. There are a bunch of other people whose just names escape me who are part of the EVNT banner, and they do phenomenal work organizing the Alliance tournament, just especially on the broadcast side, but also behind the scenes, getting things running. There's a component where CCP has to have the budget, they have to have the dev tools and the dev time to contribute, but then there's also got to be this whole broadcast structure and scheme and support team behind it to the commentary and all that sort of stuff, which the EVNT crew has really upped the quality on it, um, but also just made it possible to begin with in modern EVE Online times. So that's really cool. You are correct. Flagships, there are four ship types which cannot be a flagship. The Lashak, the Balgorn, the Rattlesnake, and the Widow. So that's really cool. Um, that would explain why there are no Balgorns as your flagships. Speaking of the broadcast and EVNT, we've got the official broadcast schedule. It's now been published, so you can go and check that out. Make your plans for the weekend of November 6th and onward, and the weekend after that. It looks like matches are beginning at 1500 EVE time, with the last match ending at 2200. So what is that? Seven hours? No. Yeah, seven full hours of Alliance Tournament matches. That is quite the um, quite a long day, but going to be quite a fun day to go and check those out. And I'm, I'm sure they're going to be updating this spreadsheet over time. So as you want to go through and see as the matches go on, when's your team coming up next, you can go and check that out. 
All right, so that's the Alliance Tournament news. Super hyped for it. I can't wait. It's just a couple of weekends out. That's going to be so much fun. Uh, if you're not interested in the Alliance Tournament itself, but you're a skin person, I believe they're still going to be giving out those skins as well for the channel points with the CCP channel. So worth tuning in whether the Alliance Tournament floats your boat or not. Stick it up on another screen. Get some skins while you're at it. And then these, man, I, I would love to see what some smarter people than I have to say about these various, various uh, flagship picks. All right, rounding out today's show in other player news, we had an interesting battle report. Not huge. It's a low sec fight between Snuffed Out and Shadow Cartel, so something that happens quite frequently. In this particular case, it took place in Orletters on the 19th, so today. And it was around 100 versus 100, or 150 versus 86, actually. But what was interesting to me are the ships that were flown. Number one, on the defender's side, there was a Fortazar coming out for its hull timer. Shadow Cartel and Dead Terror showed up to defend, and they were flying Blaster Jam Praxis, which I absolutely love. That's not something I've seen before. I think it's really freaking cool. It's very unconventional. Um, but the Praxis dual plated even, so it's going to be very slow. The blasters means it does have high damage but extremely low projection, and then the jams mean that it's harder for the enemy to volley your ships, because um, some of their fleet won't be able to lock the primary target, they can only lock the ship that currently has them jammed. And the Praxis is very good at this particular tactic because it has a ton of mid slots to use, uh, along with the rest of the step. What are they called? It's not SOE. What's that other race? The Jove race. SOCT, Society of Conscious Thought. Yeah, the yeah, SOCT. The, the SOE does not like them. <laughs> I don't know why. Their ships are really cool. Maybe that's why. Yeah. So, SOE wants to have the prettiest ships, but SOTC gives them a run for their money. Uh, yeah, Shadow Cartel has made a bit of a resurgence in the past, I guess, year and a half. Uh, when I was in Waffles living in Kanaka back April of last year until the war began, I saw them flying around again. They're they're not re quite the capable of going head to get head with snuffed out, but they're good at fighting, taking smart fights. They've gotten some pretty good wins against substantial odds, even though they don't have a substantial capital force right now. And Indeed. I guess this is another one. <laughs> yeah, well, they I don't think they won this particular fight. Um, they did lose the objective, and they did lose the Iskor because the, the Fortizar died. But one other interesting thing about this battle report, and the reason I decided to talk about it, was not only did we have the weirdness with the Blaster Jam Praxis, but we also had what Snuff brought in. They brought back Beam Capitals. And for those unfamiliar, the reason that this is a thing that may sound weird to you, you're used to seeing Dreadnoughts fit with the highest damage guns possible, which are the short range ones. But with the beam lasers, what they do is they bring their dreads super far away, like hundreds of kilometers away, one to 200 kilometers away. And then even though they're using capital sized weapons, because they're so far away, the transversal is so low on these armor battleships of the other side that they're still able to hit and just absolutely nuke battleships. So if you if you go through the battle report even, you'll see that a lot of these praxies, they died to the capitals, not necessarily to the TFI fleet, which is what was supporting them on the Snuffed Out side. Yeah, I've, if you see Snuffed Out brought a few Vindicators, and my guess is that they were using the Vindicators to web down targets for the Dreads. Absolutely, yep. And with the Vindies, if you get some Abyssal webs, then you can get down to 99% web, and it's it's incredible the amount of damage that a Dreadnought with capital guns can do if something is Vindy webbed that hard. Um, but I just thought it was cool. You don't see the beam laser dreads very much anymore. I think the last time they were super popular was when Boosh Ravens were still a thing. So you'd bring in your, your cap gun, your beam laser dreadnought, so they could still shoot the Boosh Ravens no matter where they booshed on the grid, which is really cool. Uh, but that's interesting. A bit of nostalgia for me, and I thought it was worth mentioning. Any other final thoughts for today's show, Gregorn, before we wrap it up? I think that's all I, w I had in mind to cover today. Awesome. Definitely be an interesting time. Keep a look on the markets. As we mentioned, the ships which benefit the most from the drones. 
um, the new mutoplasmids coming out, how much those are going to be worth is going to tell a lot about how much it's worth running the new grab sites, the Concord Rogue Analysis Beacons. I personally, if I'm looking at my hopes and dreams, my wildest hopes and dreams are that these crab sites are worth running. And they're worth running, they're incredibly valuable, and as a result, number one, these mutoplasmids are everywhere so I can roll my drones. And number two, so that there are more of these capitals in space dying, but also so that the pilots flying them, the pilots risking them, have enough ISK to buy them at the new prices. We did a show a few weeks ago. Um, Abby and Ren and I think we had some other people on. I forget who our guest was that time. Uh, Ravendale, maybe? They, they were on the show and they were talking about capital construction, how it's just not worth it right now. I personally hope that these new crab sites make it valuable enough that people are willing to spend the obscene amounts of this you need to buy capitals so they can run them. That's probably a pipe dream at this point, but that's what I'm hoping for. I'm not expecting that it to be the this to have enough of an effect to make the cost of building capitals worthwhile but it would be nice to make it work cost effective to build them yep Alrighty, well that'll do it for today's episode of talking yeah. stations we've got some really cool stuff coming down the pipeline i don't have my notes pulled up at the moment let me try and find them I know this coming Sunday, we're going to have the mastermind behind the HiSec buyback program, the sponsor of Talking In Stations, um, but you've probably seen them elsewhere or use their service. He's going to be on the show, Rehan, talking with us about that. Also tomorrow, we've got Shen coming on, and he's going to be talking about the war going on. We didn't do your war update today. Shen's going to have you covered on that one tomorrow. And then some other cool stuff coming up on Thursday, which I just cannot recall at the moment, but Rund will be there holding down the fort with his chill vibes and interesting guests. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of Talking Stations. See you tomorrow. Okay.